Welcome to Earth Science Lecture. This is Professor Diana L. Pomeroy, and this week we'll learn about plate tectonics. The interior of the Earth consists of three main layers. The core, which is super hot, super dense, with iron and nickel inside. The mantle, which is solid to near liquid silica rich rocks. And the crust, which is made of solid silica rich rocks. On this slide, we have the process of magmatic convection where superheated, super dense magma is rising to the surface. And as it rises, it spreads out. As it spreads out away from that center point of heat, it will cool and gain density and then be pulled back down into the mantle and destroyed. And so this process, this exchange of density and temperature is what's referred to as magmatic convection. Magmatic convection produces breaks in the crust, and places on Earth exist where new crust is made, a ridge, or destroyed, a trench. This illustration shows presence of ridges and trenches, in addition to volcanoes and the different types of plate boundaries that exist where we find ridges and trenches on Earth. We know today that the Earth's crust is divided into tectonic plates, which are again bounded by these features that often exist on the seafloor, ridges and trenches. But the theory of plate tectonics didn't come about until the 1950s and the 1960s. It wasn't fully accepted as part of our understanding of how the Earth's surface has changed until that time. Around 1912, Alfred Wegener, a German meteorologist, proposed a then radical hypothesis that the plates of the Earth's crust could move and that at one time the continents were joined into a single landmass or a supercontinent. Wegener termed the motion of the crust continental drift. During the 1900s, when his idea was proposed, scientists were convinced that the continents were fixed in place that the seafloor was flat, and the temporary land bridges formed between continents to allow for distribution of organisms globally. Wigner's hypothesis of continental drift was based on several key factors. The first factor in continental drift was the fit of certain continents, in particular those of South America and Africa. As you'll see on this illustration of the world, the east coast of South America appears to fit inside the west coast of Africa. This is no coincidence, and scientists had recognized this, as well as lay people had recognized this concept for thousands of years prior uh, to Wegener's understanding. But he was one of the first to actually record this in terms of evidence for the presence of drift. The second key factor in the theory of continental drift that Wegener had proposed was the distribution of certain fossil organisms around the world. In particular, those of Glossopteris, which is a tree fern represented here on this map by a green dot, and Mesosaurus, which is a small reptile that lived in a river environment. And it's represented here on this map by a purple dot. Most of these organisms would live in environments that did not support the existence of temporary land bridges. And in addition to that, the current climate belts that exist along each latitude did not match well with the fossil species that were found on these continents either. The third key factor was the similarity in the climates across continents and latitudes that match well with the fossil distribution and rock, rock types between the continents of that time. On this map of the world, you can see that coal swamps, deserts, 
salt deposits, reefs, and the presence of glaciers all indicate that at one time, in addition to the fossil distribution of species across these continents, it indicated that at one point in the past, the continents were merged into a single landmass and gradually drifted apart from each other. The final factor in continental drift was the presence of glaciers that could be connected between the southernmost points of the southern continents. Glaciers leave scrapes against sediments and other rocks near surface and leave glacial till deposits behind as they advance and retreat across the landscape. If the continents were fixed, the presence of these glaciers should only be in Antarctica rather than dispersed throughout the southernmost continents. Unfortunately, Wegener's hypothesis was rejected by, by the scientific community, in part because he could not find the evidence for the internal mechanism to show how the continents had drifted apart over time. Wegener unfortunately died while doing a research expedition to collect ice cores in parts of Greenland and Iceland, and uh, his body uh, was preserved in ice. And uh, again, unfortunately, throughout uh, much of his life as a researcher, he was essentially made fun of, put down uh, for the work that he did. So it wasn't until some time later, maybe around 20 or 30 years later, that his work became vindicated. And unfortunately, he had already passed on by that point. So here we have an image of Marie Tharp, who is an oceanographer and a cartographer, a person that makes maps of the seafloor, and that is what Marie Tharp did. So for many years, she worked alongside an oceanographer named Bruce Heason, and her work was to map out sections of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and she did so essentially on her own. Unfortunately, at the time that Marie Tharp was working, this is the 1940s and 1950s, so at the time she was doing her research alongside her partner Bruce Heason, she was not allowed to go on oceanographic expeditions, uh, she was not allowed to go into a submarine to voyage or even into a ship to voyage with other uh, oceanographers. Uh, at the time, that was considered bad luck uh, to have a woman aboard a research vessel. And uh, women were often, women and people of color, uh, were often placed into subservient type roles uh, within the scientific community starting in the 1940s and 1950s. And it wasn't until the civil rights movement began, and really until fairly recently in the uh, 80s going forward, that our ideas of what it means to be a scientist, whether that is uh, as someone who presents as a woman or someone who uh, is um, of a race other than white and <laughs> gender other than male, uh, all of those restrictions have been in place again since the 40s and 50s. And so unfortunately, someone like Marie Tharp, her work was really undervalued and uh, was kind of pushed aside in favor of her partner, Bruce Heason. And so again, uh, their work showed that what Wegener had proposed in the 1910s and 1920s with Continental Drift, their work showed that what he was saying was true and it also showed that the seafloor was not a flat, dead region as had been previously believed, that the seafloor had these immense volcanoes and mountains and valleys on it. And so again, her work was some of the first to have us recognize what the seafloor actually looked like. And her maps, Marie Tharp's maps, are still used today in oceanographic studies. And again, uh, ever since really the civil rights movement in the 60s, uh, we've been pushing for better representation in the sciences. And unfortunately, we still have a long way to go because there are many labs today that are very similar uh, to the experiences that SARP had endured.
um, as a scientist and renowned one at that uh, in her field of study. So in the 1950s, aside from the work of uh, Heezen and Tharp, there was the work of this person here. His name was Harry Hess. He was a naval officer and an oceanographer that served during World War II. And post-World War II, he did several submarine voyages to the East Pacific Rise. So while Tharp and Heezen, their work was focused on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Harry Hess was looking at the East Pacific Rise. So Hess and all his work taken together with the work of other oceanographers that he uh, had teams with developed a hypothesis known as seafloor spreading. So the seafloor spreading hypothesis essentially states that new seafloor was developed at the ridges in the Earth's crust and the older seafloor was destroyed on the opposite side of the world at trenches. So this holds to the law of conservation of energy and matter which states that things on Earth are neither created nor destroyed, and the formation and destruction of this crust was due to also magmatic convection. Uh, so this magmatic convection going on in the asthenosphere and the mantle, this is what uh, Hess had observed indirectly uh, through the presence of volcanoes in the East Pacific rise. Now, at the time that this information had come out in the 50s, our technology had advanced considerably. Not only were we using seismic sounding and sonar to basically create the maps on the seafloor like Tharp had done, but also uh, to visualize uh, seafloor features like volcanoes and valleys and canyons. And so scientists at the time were blown away by what was being observed because again, the status quo was that the seafloor is flat and the continents are fixed. But this started to give rise to a mechanism for that continental motion that Wegener had hinted at uh, some decades before. And the last point of this, the turning point of this uh, theory of plate tectonics was the work of a team of UK scientists and their last names were Vine and Matthews. So at the same time that Hess is doing his work and that Tharp and Heisen are doing their work, uh, Matthews and Vine put forth their own hypothesis based on paleomagnetic data. So understand that the interior of the Earth, the core of the Earth, because it is metallic, the inner core rotates at a different rate because it's a solid than the surrounding outer liquid core. Because of these differences in speed and directionality of rotation, the magnetic field of the Earth is then generated from the core. The magnetic field is not a constant, so the magnetic field can flip over time. Sometimes the magnetic field is aligned with true north, and that is what we call a magnetic normal, or a positive anomaly. Other times, the magnetic field is an opposite to the true north, and in which case the south becomes north. Uh, this is known as a reversal or a negative magnetic anomaly. So what Vine and Matthews did was they were studying the Mid-Indian Ridge and in studying the Mid-Indian Ridge they determined through paleomagnetic data the timing of when sections of seafloor were being made and deposited. And this backed Hess's observation that the ridge should have younger geologic material and the center point, and then the edges of the ridge farthest away from that center point should have older material. And so there was a perfect alignment between the timing of these normal and reversal events with the deposition of those seafloor materials. And so uh, the reason why the seafloor is a good location uh, for determining these changes in paleomagnetism is because a lot of times C4 contains a lot of iron and uh, magnesium elements in it. And so these elements are, again, more magnetically sensitive and they're able to detect changes to our magnetic field over thousands to millions of years of time. So again, through the work of Vaughn and Matthews coupled with Hess and then uh, Tharp and Heesen, 
in addition to the earlier work by Wegener, which had been previously rejected. All of this taken together is what built the theory of plate tectonics, which is what we have today. So within the theory of plate tectonics, again, we have this understanding that the Earth's surface has changed over its 4.6 billion year history, and that these changes are due to interactions between the asthenosphere, which is part of the uh, upper mantle and lithosphere crust, so connected together. And again, these changes are inherent in the presence of volcanic activity, earthquake activity, development of mountains, and the development of island arcs. All of this activity together, volcanoes, earthquakes, mountain building, these events are termed tectonic events and the Earth's surface has eight major tectonic plates. Between each of these plates, we have different types of, of crust. There's continental crust, and then there's also oceanic crust. And these crustal plates are different in their density and in their thickness. And this can cause changes in the interaction at each of the boundary points on Earth. There are three major plate boundaries, and these are convergent, represented on this map as a sawtooth pattern with red triangles. Divergent, where we have a vertical line that is moved or offset by a series of transform faults. And we have transform fault motion or transform boundary motion itself, represented here by these half arrows with the San Andreas Fault. So again, those are three major plate boundaries, convergent, divergent, and transform. And at each of these boundaries, we tend to find a combination of volcanic activity and earthquake activity, or tectonic activity. Tectonic means to build. And so tectonic plates were built up over, again, hundreds of millions of years, if not billions of years of time. So there's two major categories of crust on Earth. These are oceanic crust and continental crust. So oceanic crust tends to be thinner than continental crust. Oceanic crust is also more dense than continental crust. So continental crust is thicker material. It's usually less dense. Oceanic crust tends to have more iron and magnesium present in its silica rich rock whereas the continents have less iron and magnesium. And this means that the continents tend to be more buoyant uh, and uh, older in their geology than the oceans are. And the way that these tectonic plates interact, the way that the crust interacts with different sections at the boundary is dependent on the type of crust that's meeting at the boundary point. So there's, again, three major categories of plate motion. There's convergence, divergence, and transform motion. So with convergent motion, this is when two tectonic plates collide with each other. Now recall that this collision event is not just because of the crust over floating on top of the asthenosphere. Understand that the crust and the asthenosphere are actually connected together. It's kind of like a s'more. In a s'more, you have the uppermost layer, that's the graham cracker, consider that the crust. Underneath that, you've got some lithospheric mantle material, consider that almost like the chocolate. And underneath that, you've got the asthenosphere. Think of that as like the molten marshmallow. So in a sense, asthenosphere magma is very much like that. It's not quite a liquid, yet not quite a solid. And it flows. So depending on the direction and type of force that's associated with the motion, the crust is going to shift and move and break. And also depending on the thickness of that crust, that's also going to have an effect on the features that we can observe at each of these boundaries. So with convergence, as the plates collide with one another, if you have oceanic crust and continental crust colliding, or oceanic and oceanic crust colliding, what develops is what's known as a trench. The more dense oceanic crust will subduct or be pulled beneath the overriding plate. This is due to compression, a compressional force 
Now this type of energy also generates a specific type of volcano, which I talk about in a later YouTube video. Go ahead and check that out. It's called Volcanoes. So go ahead and check out that lecture um, if you'd like to learn more about the different types of volcanoes that form near trenches. Now there's also another type of convergence, which I'll show you in the next slide, which has to do with continental convergence. Uh, this is slightly different because again, the continental crust is thicker than the oceanic crust. So as these, as these plates collide with each other, right, that's going to push up that material and create mountains rather than a trench in volcanoes or rather than a series of island arcs instead. Divergence is a boundary point where the tectonic plates are being pushed away from each other. To diverge is to move away. So this is where the seafloor spreading hypothesis came into play. Spreading centers are otherwise known as ridges, where superheated magma continues to rise to the surface, again, producing a different type of volcano than what we have with convergence. And as it does so, as the superheated magma rises, the overlying crust just continues to get pushed away. This phenomenon is known as ridge push. So divergence is created due to tension. There's a tensional force going on inside the Earth that's generating this type of plate boundary, where the tectonic plates are moving away from each other. Finally, we have a transform plate boundary. Along a transform plate boundary, two sections of tectonic plates are not colliding with each other and they're not pulling away from each other. They're moving past one another. And in some cases, this motion is prone to sticking because of the frictional energy uh, between the plates. And so depending on the material, depending on the crust and uh, the length of the boundary, uh, this has an effect on that type of motion. So again, we have convergence, divergence, and transform boundary motion. So divergent plate boundaries occur where ridges form. Once again, in this process known as ridge push, old crust is forced away from the magma plume in the center. Magma reaches the surface and cools, and it forms new crust. So at the ridge, we get new seafloor. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is shown in the map on the right, is an excellent example of a divergent plate boundary. What's also shown in this map are rates of plate motion. Note that the rates of plate motion here are represented in millimeters per year, on average, this equates to maybe one to two inches a year, which means that it's about the same rate that your fingernails grow in terms of motion along this divergent boundary. Convergent plate boundaries occur where trenches and mountains form, in addition to island arcs, which are not pictured. In this process with subduction, known as slab pull, old crust is forced into the earth Magma will then destroy the crust and produce a line of volcanoes bounding a trench. The Himalayas and the Mariana Trench are excellent examples of convergent plate boundaries. The map and diagram on the left, on the lower left, are the Himalayan plateau, and the rate of motion there is actually a little bit faster than what we had on the previous slide. So this rate of plate motion is greater, again, because of that compressional force but it's slower than what we find with the subduction on the opposite side of the slide on the opposite image with the map of uh, the Indo-Australian plate meeting the Caroline plate. That subduction process is a little bit different. I note that it's a lot faster. And again, this is because of that interaction between the thinner oceanic crust and the thicker continental crust. So that compressional force is what's causing these boundaries to form and the development of those C4 features of trenches. Transform plate boundaries occur where pieces of the crust experience frictional force, which is known as shear. In this process, the plates slide past one another. Often, transform boundaries are associated with ridges. These boundaries are represented by transform faults or fracture zones, and they often offset a ridge or a line of mountains or volcanoes. So this type of motion is often associated with that. However, as in the case of our state, one of those transform boundaries became displaced and has now sectioned off a good portion of California into this right lateral motion. 
If you'd like to learn more about the development of California as a state, I have an entire YouTube video on my channel dedicated to the tectonic history of California. So I'll teach you more about each of the boundaries that we have here, including the San Andreas Fault. The presence of plate tectonic boundaries and plate motion can often be traced through earthquake and volcanic activity. Each red dot on this diagram represents the presence of an active volcano. Not all volcanoes are associated with plate boundaries. A hot spot is a plume of magma that continues to produce new volcanoes as the overlying plate moves over it. The most well studied hotspot is the one that formed where the Hawaiian Island chain is today. What's not illustrated here is also the Yellowstone National Park hotspot that sits in the middle of the North American plate. This image illustrates the motion of the Pacific plate over the Hawaiian hotspot, generating each of the islands over a span of 6 million years of time. Note that the mantle plume is constant, whereas the island motion is not. So the mantle plume is fixed and the overlying Pacific plate is moving across that plume and each time it does it generates a new set of volcanoes and a new set of islands along with that motion. A fault is a fracture of the Earth's crust. These fractures occur due to strain when the crust is brittle, usually at low temperatures and pressures. There are several terms illustrated in this diagram that I'm going to be introducing to you when I discuss different types of faults. In particular, the fault plane, which is a geometric plane that a fault line follows, and the hanging wall and foot wall, which are sections of rocks or formations or tectonic blocks that move with respect to that fault plane. There are three major categories of faults, each with a different type of movement along the fault plane. There are dip-slip faults, which are further categorized as normal and reverse, strike-slip faults, which are further categorized as left lateral and right lateral, and oblique-slip faults. For the purposes of this class, we're just going to go over dip-slip faults and strike-slip faults. Dip-slip faults include normal and reverse faults. Their movement is dependent on the dip or slope of the landscape. These faults have rock movement where the hanging wall will move up or down relative to the fault plane. Normal faults are due to tensional forces in the crust. In a normal fault, the hanging wall moves down relative to the foot wall. These tensional faults extend the landscape. In some cases, they're associated with ridge formation and divergent boundaries in terms of the force that's involved. So normal faults are due to tensional force. The hanging wall will drop down relative to the foot wall along the fault plane. Reverse faults are due to compressional forces in the crust. In a reverse fault, the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall. In some cases, reverse faults are associated with mountain formation and convergent plate boundaries. These fault types will produce severe earthquakes. And the reason why they're related is because, again, they're due to compressional force. So reverse faults are when the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall along that fault plane. Strike slip faults occur when the crust moves laterally due to shear stress. Their movement is dependent on the strike of the landscape. They move left or right relative to the fault plane. So instead of an up or down motion, it's a horizontal motion. Strike slip faults are often connected to ridges or they can develop into their own transform plate boundaries. Another name for strike slip faults are transform faults. One of the most well-known strike slip faults is the San Andreas Fault, which represents the transform boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. On this slide, we have a map of the San Andreas Fault, which is a right lateral fault, and we have a flyover image of the Carrizo Plain in California, which shows the sectioned off 
uh, portions of this mountain ridge that have been moved by the San Andreas Fault. Any motion along a fault can generate an earthquake. An earthquake is a seismic wave that travels through the Earth's crust at varying speeds, depending on the force of the disturbance. The central or origin point of the earthquake is called the focus. That's usually at a greater depth than the crust. What we feel at the surface is the epicenter, which translates directly from the focus. Seismic waves will then radiate out from the epicenter and travel through the crust and through the mantle and core of the Earth itself, depending on the depth of the earthquake, the depth of the focus, and the amount of displacement of that rock material. Earthquakes release energy in the form of a seismic wave. The movement of a seismic wave is similar to dropping a rock in a still pond. Ripples radiate outward from that central point of disturbance. And energy is then displaced through this wave motion. So waves and wave activity are due to a displacement of energy. If you'd like to learn more about wave motion and wave energy, I have a YouTube video that I've got posted under my oceanography playlist. So go ahead and check that out if you'd like to learn more. Body waves are seismic waves that travel through Earth's interior. There are two types of these waves, P or primary waves and S or secondary waves. Both earthquake activity and volcanic activity are used to track plate motion over time. These data are also used to approximate the position of the continents over millions of years of time. The Paleozoic was dominated by continental collisions as Pangaea began to assemble. On this slide, we have an image of Pangaea during the beginning of the, or during the end of the Paleozoic era. So the Paleozoic era is the first era of geologic time. So this is a brief overview of what's happening to Pangaea over hundreds of millions of years. Recognize that there have been other supercontinents on Earth's surface. If you're interested, I will be posting more videos about this through the Dinosaur Paleontology uh, playlist and through other future playlists on YouTube. So again, the Paleozoic era is the first era of geologic time. We'll learn more about geologic time and Earth's changes in later lectures. The Mesozoic era was a time of great tectonic change. Pangaea split apart, sea level rose, and the Western Interior Seaway formed. Here we have Pangaea, and Pangaea will gradually split apart into two continents, which are termed Laurasia and Gondwana. Now, depending on the course that you're taking. Uh, Laurasia is sometimes, if you're talking about North America, we're looking at Laurentia, uh, and Gondwana is sometimes referred to as Gondwanaland. Uh, so it just depends on the course that you're taking. In my course, uh, we refer to these continents as such as Laurasia and Gondwana. Now Gondwana remained uh, as a connected continent through most of the Mesozoic era through the time of the dinosaurs. So the Mesozoic era began with the Triassic period, and then we move into the uh, Jurassic period. So the Triassic period lasted from about 250 million years ago till about 200 million years ago. And then we have the Jurassic period, which lasted from about uh, 200 million years ago to about 150 million years ago. And so here we have changes to each of those land masses over time. Note how sea level is changing, how the continents are gradually drifting away from each other into their more modern positions. And then during the Cretaceous period, here's the start of the Cretaceous, around uh, 150 million years ago until 66 million years ago. And here's the Western Interior Seaway in the middle of North America there. So the continents are finally beginning to split apart even more. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is beginning to form and the Atlantic Basin is beginning to open. At the same time, the Pacific Basin is beginning to be subducted. And so this process of subduction uh, was ongoing for hundreds of millions of years throughout the Mesozoic of the Pacific Ocean Basin. And it's still ongoing today. So 
what this means is is that in you know hundreds of millions of years the Pacific Ocean basin will be much smaller uh, than the Atlantic and the continents will uh, merge into a single landmass again. So during the Cenozoic era, which is our era of time, uh, from 66 million years ago to the present, what happened was several things. Continents, as you can see of this image from the Miocene epoch, uh, the continents had merged into pretty much their current locations. Uh, sea level had dropped during this time, and the eastern and western margins of the North American continent would develop both passive and active uh, margins. The Rocky Mountains, the Basin and Range Province, and volcanic activity continued to develop, and uh, the shoreline of California also developed during this time. So the San Andreas Fault had fully formed from about 20 million years ago to the present, and this tectonic activity is still going on today. We still have volcanic activity and earthquake activity that randomly occurs over Earth's surface. All kinds of tectonic change has happened uh, to our world over about 4.6 billion years, and this was only the last 500 million years of those changes. Again, if you'd like to learn more about the tectonic history of California, feel free to check out that video on my playlist. So next time, we're going to learn more about the minerals of the Earth's surface, and we'll start learning about the rock cycle. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture on plate tectonics, and thanks for watching.